Hello, all. We're going to welcome you to the afternoon panel, Energy so, Environment. If, if you're interested, um, here we should have a rousing time. session for everyone post lunch, so it's pretty exciting. My name is Kayla Harris. Um, I'm from the Lucy Burns Institute, which runs Ballotpedia. We're an almanac of American politics. Um, if you are a state legislature out there, chances are that we have a page about you. So you should take the time to Google yourself, see what comes up, and you'll probably find our profile. Kind of exciting. Um, today we have three exciting speakers. Representative Ken Ivory, um, Todd Myers, and James Taylor. Uh, Ken Ivory is the president of the American Lands Council. He was the force behind House Bill 48, the Transfer of Public Lands Act in Utah, um, with the goal of educating people on federal land management issues um, is something that the American Lands Council does, and the federal land divide between the East and West. He'll talk about that more today. Todd Myers is the director for the Center of, for Environment at Washington Policy Center. He's the author of EcoFads, which he can show you. <laughs> um, something that we know about a lot in Seattle, and I bet you'll talk about more. Um, and then he knows a lot about free market alternatives to cutting carbon emissions. And then we have James Taylor, the Vice President for External Relations at Heartland. He is the managing, or for many years, was the managing editor of Environmental and Climate News, um, and he has a weekly column with Forbes. Uh, so I thought we'd start out by giving everyone five to ten minutes to kind of talk about their issues that are of interest, and then I have some questions I can ask, or we can open the floor to questions. So maybe we'll start with Ken Ivory. Okay. We, are we, I guess we're, we're hot. Okay. Um, meaning our mics are on. It is after lunch. So. Uh, you, anytime I see a group like this, I get excited because I can't help but think of 56 people sitting in a room and change the world against all possible odds. I mean, think about that. They had no resources. They had no uh, backing. They had no business doing what they did, and yet they formed a completely unique form of government. There's such incredible opportunity. We have such tremendous problems, six million acres a year burning, millions of animals being burned alive, watershed being destroyed, uh, blue ribbon fisheries, habitat, air pollution, and yet there is a fringe group that calls that environmentalism. You think about that, what an opportunity. What an opportunity we have to, to occupy that field, to, to uh, make apparent to the public what these policies have done. It's important that we understand, though, that the, the issues that we have, you have the little card on, uh, on your desk. I mean, that map tells the whole story. This morning, uh, Senator Fielder from Montana I took a walk down to Pike Street and, and the market and those down there, and she's got a phone case that has this map on the back of it. So she's taking a picture of them setting up the case of the fish market, and the guy setting up the fish market says, hey, what's that? And so she takes the map and says, well, the red is the federally controlled land. And the guy just did a complete double take. He just, why is it like that? Well, isn't that the question? Because the federal government controls more than 50% of the land west of the Rocky Mountains and less than 5% of the land east of the Rocky Mountains. And there really is no good reason why, except those in control and power in Washington say, you can't manage your own land. That's really the fundamental reason when you when you drill right down to the heart of it. You in the West are incapable of managing your own lands because the federal government loses 27 cents for every dollar it spends managing public lands. So of course it should try to make it up in volume. <laughs> right? The states generate a positive $14.51 for every dollar they spend managing public land. But you see what this represents, this represents a fundamental system problem. I mean, it's, it's an incredible property issue. It's an incredible issue for, for the, the economic opportunity and ability and the kinds of things that we heard at lunch, this, this uh, entrepreneurial innovation. It represents all sorts of things there. It represents economic security. It represents national security. It represents environmental degradation on, a, on an epic scale. But fundamentally, it's a system problem because if you think back to our government, right, in our system, our unique system, governments exist to secure fundamental rights. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, which was defined as property and self-government. And to secure those rights, governments exist. And we went another step for, forward that was uh, beyond that, that was completely unique. 
We said we divided the power among two distinct governments, and they control each other as a double security to those rights of the people. And the delegation of that power was few and defined and numerous and indefinite. That's the system problem that we have. It was mentioned earlier about uh, uh, food stamps, right, in the education panel. Think about what happened just last year. Just last year, you all know, uh, most of you from the West, I know we had someone from Oklahoma, this may be something new to, to some of you, uh, some South Dakota and North Dakota folks, but when, when Congress, it wasn't until 1976 that Congress said, we're just gonna keep all those lands in federal ownership. We've had a trust obligation since 1780, before the nation was founded, in the middle of the Revolutionary War, the states that had Western lands put them in a trust. The Supreme Court called it a trust repeatedly. They put the land in trust to create new states, same rights of sovereignty, freedom, independence, use the proceeds of sale to pay the debt of the war, pay the national debt. It's been the same from all states west of the colonies. And, uh, and yet, what we see happening, so from 1780 to 1976, the federal government knew it was supposed to dispose of the land because in your constitution, when you pull it out and read Article 4, rights of and obligations to the states, Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2 says, Congress shall have the power to dispose of territory and other property, and nothing in the constitution shall prejudice any claims of the states or of the United States. It doesn't say Congress shall have the power to keep the land forever and ever and ever and ever, which is the way federal agents read it today. It's very clear. Congress shall have the power to dispose of. They knew of that all the way up to 1976 when they said we're now going to keep the land in federal ownership. And yet, in doing that, they said not to worry, you in the western states, because we know some of your counties have only 3% taxable land, some even less than that. Not to worry, we're going to give you payment in lieu of the taxes that you would otherwise generate if you had control of your property and self-governance and liberty, and those governments were doing what they were designed to do to protect liberty, property, self-governance. We're going to give you payment in lieu of the taxes you would otherwise generate if you governed yourself. It's called PILT. We call it pennies in lieu of trillions. Because that's what we have locked up all over the West, right? So the, just, just to tell you why this matters to all of us, we were talking to Isaac uh, Luttrell, Representative Luttrell from uh, Lateral, from uh, South Dakota. Think about what happened just last year. PILT. Harry Reid wanted to increase food stamps by $200 billion over five years. To do that, he held 24 Senate votes hostage and said he would not pay, he would not fund $400 million in PILT unless the senators and representatives in the West agreed to $200 billion increase in food stamps. Think about that. Think about that. So people in the East, they're extracting $2 billion a year from folks in the East to control lands in the West, burn 6 million acres a year, destroy habitat, kill animals, pollute the air, destroy the watershed, call that environmentalism, and politically hold the entire nation hostage. Because when you're dependent, when you're exploitable, under a system that has governments that are intended, designed to compete with each other, if you're exploitable, you will be exploited. That's what this represents. This represents a system failure. And so we can come up with new policies. We can come up with different ways for the federal government to manage the land, different ways to try to get along. But fundamentally, that's a system problem at the very heart of our federative system of government. So what's happening? We passed the bill in Utah to, in uh, 2012, House Bill 148, Transfer Public Lands Act. Since then, we've had states all over the West, with the only exception of California, because we simply haven't had the time to get there and work there. States have passed bills, introduced bills. Arizona just passed a, a couple of bills this year to get into uh, the, the study of the transfer. We're learning repeatedly that federal management, environmentally, economically, has failed demonstrably. That's what centralizing the management of unique and diverse lands does by definition. You can't deal with these unique diversities that we have. Um, so legislation is moving forward in all the states. In Congress, there is a federal land action group where they're studying the history, the law, the legislation to move forward in Congress. Utah has appropriated $2 million. We've just hired a, a, a first class legal team that includes some of the top legal scholars in the nation to move forward the legal effort. At the same time, we're moving forward with education, negotiation, legislation, and 
and litigation, those things are all moving forward. Now let me tell you what, what the opportunity that we have. You all represent the very best lobbying force that there is. You, your counties, the people you associate with, incredible lobbying force. We're getting calls from presidential candidates now saying brief us please on this issue because it's a solution that's actually big enough to the problems we face in our nation. It's systemic, but the resources that are at play environmentally and economically from a national security standpoint are fundamental to being able to move forward. It's an opportunity big enough to move forward in our nation to the tremendous problems we face. Just give you a quick story and just end with there and pass on. I was in D.C. Um, in June, and we met with Barbara, we met with uh, Representative McMorris Rogers. And uh, as soon as I, I'd been in Washington, I'd been here invited to a number of counties to speak on this issue, a number of counties and areas in, in most of your states. But when I walked into Representative McMorris' office, I, I've never met her before, but as she walked up, she stuck her hand out and she said, Representative Ivory, you're a rock star in my district. Please tell me everything I need to know about this issue. Well, it's not because I'm a rock star. It's because her county commissioners and the state representatives and the senators and the people in their district and the people in the parties and the people in the farm bureaus have been messaging her repeatedly to say, hey, we've got to solve this problem. It, it matters on so many levels to the health, safety, and welfare of our community. That's where we go forward. So I've got additional information. I've got a few thumb drives left. That's the information we're providing to presidential candidates. You've got some of these materials uh, in front of you. I will just point out quickly, on the back, you see what that map used to look like. That's what this, this map used to look like in the 1850s when Florida was 90% federally controlled. Michigan, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi. Florida used to send resolutions to Congress and say, we're the worst off of all the western states. Florida, right? Think about your geography. We're the worst off of all the western states because Congress is not disposing of our land. We're 90% federally controlled for decades. We can't educate our kids, grow our economy. Our people are fleeing the state. They banded together and did the very same thing we're, we're doing today because they recognized it was fundamentally a system issue, that if they didn't resolve the system issue, it doesn't matter what the policy or the personality is. It's exactly where we are today. Your help is critical, and uh, look forward to questions and uh, any other information we might be able to provide to you. So I'm Todd Myers. Uh, I'm the environmental director of the Washington Policy Center here in Seattle. Um, I get to deal with the environmentalists here, so you don't have to. <laughs> I think fundamentally when you talk about environmental issues, um, oftentimes on the free market conservative side, um, we talk about the, the things that uh, Representative Ivory just talked about, which is governance and the Constitution and property rights and things like that. Um, the environmentalists never talk about that because they don't care about that. Um, we talk about jobs. We talk about the impact of jobs and prosperity of uh, environmental regulation. Uh, the environmentalists at least try to make an argument about that subsidies for solar and other things like that create jobs. Um, but they quickly give up on that. When you push back and you say, Oregon is the number one green jobs state in the country and they have higher unemployment than the country as a whole, they sort of go, it doesn't matter, it's good for the environment. Okay? So we win when it comes to constitution and jobs. But my message to you is we also win and we should be forceful about pointing out that we win when it comes to the environment. Look at a map. Environmentalists can be identified by people who have sequestered themselves in places where we have paved over the environment to within an inch of its life with concrete, steel, and asphalt. Conservatives who, and people who believe in the free market are the ones who actually live near the nature, near the environment. They make it not just something that they care about, they make it their lifestyle. And yet it is the people who live surrounded by concrete and steel who lecture the people who live near nature about how to care for the environment. And part of the reason that, that occurs is we allow it to. Our immediate answer when it comes to how do we care for the environment is not, I know how to care for the environment, I live there. It is, don't kill my jobs. Okay. We need to start with, look, don't tell me how to care for the environment, I do it every day. And the fact is, is that 
sitting here in Seattle, I can tell you that the policies of the free market do more for the environment than the policies of the environmental left. Talking about land stewardship, I used to work for the State Department of Natural Resources, which manages um, all the state um, trust lands, primarily forest land, but um, aquatic lands and a variety of other things. And uh, in 1999, we passed a law requiring that all salmon culverts um, be upgraded so that you could open salmon habitat. Salmon habitat is a very important um, environmental value in Washington State. I actually sit on the State Salmon Recovery Council. And we're trying to find ways to open up habitat. And what happens is you have these little tubes that the salmon can't get through that block up huge uh, uh, areas of habitat for salmon. But you contrast the management on state lands and on federal lands. And what you find is, is that on state lands, where there is timber harvesting that generates revenue, the state is almost done on state trust lands fixing those salmon culverts. On federal lands, they are decades behind because there is no revenue associated with it. And what you find is situations where you have to rely on Congress to fund these very unsexy projects that would open up salmon habitat, but there's no revenue stream associated with it. Where there is business, there is sustainability. You can't be environmentally sustainable unless you're economically sustainable. And so often what happens with politicians when they look to fund um, projects that would actually help the environment. It sort of reminds me when I was in Las Vegas and I came out and there was a guy and he said, sir, I'm very hungry, I haven't eaten today, can you give me some food or some money for some food? And I said, how do I know that you're going to spend this money on food and not just gamble it away? And he said, oh, well, I got gambling money. <laughs> and so when we ask Congress or other folks to say, we need money to fund salmon habitat, to open these culverts, to fix them, right? They spend the money on sexy projects like subsidizing solar and other things which have very little environmental benefit, but they don't fund the things that are less sexy. And the reason is, is that they fall for fads. When push comes to shove, when the choice between looking good and making symbolic gestures and actually doing the things that help the environment the political left chooses the symbolic gestures. And let me just give you one last example. Here in Seattle, we used to have a mayor named Greg Nichols, who um, he uh, w wanted to be the, the sort of the greenest mayor in the country. And so he, uh, in 2005, said that if George Bush wouldn't sign the Kyoto Protocol, by God, he would. And he got 1,000 cities across the country to sign the US Conference of Mayors Climate Protection Agreement which pledged that by 2012, they would hit the Kyoto Protocol targets that George Bush would not. Okay. So in 2009, when he left office because he was voted out, they did a survey and they found that in fact, that they had met the Kyoto Protocol targets. The problem was is that all of the reductions that had come were due to one thing, and that was people switching from home, oil, home heating oil to natural gas in the 1990s, long before he was ever mayor. And in fact, said, I, I wrote in my book, it says, these reductions occurred in the 1990s as city residents converted from expensive carbon intensive heating oil to cheaper natural gas, which produces far fewer greenhouse gas emissions for each unit of energy produced. Um, Seattle officials even admitted that these occurred, quote, for economic reasons, natural gas has gained favor over oil for space heating since 1990. Here's the last kicker. When 2012 came, Seattle had not actually met the Kyoto targets and their CO2 emissions were going up. There were about 38 cities in Washington state that had signed the US Conference of Mayors Climate Protection Agreement. And we called all of them to say, you've signed this in 2005, it's now 2012, did you meet the targets? Two thirds of them said, I don't know what you're talking about. It was symbolism not effectiveness. And the fact is that the free market does more to help the environment by promoting an ethic that to do more with less. And when we talk about the environment, we ought to first be very clear that our policies actually produce results, that we care about making the environment a better place, that we don't allow forests to be destroyed, that we clean up 
salmon culverts and create more habitat. We can also talk about jobs. We can also talk about the Constitution. But my encouragement to you is don't forget that we are better on the very basic issue of helping the environment and producing results. All right, I'm James Taylor. I am Senior Fellow for Environment Policy at the Hartman Institute. I've been overseeing our energy and environment uh, policy for 15 years. And uh, if there's one thing that I would like you to take away from what I have to say today, it's this. Energy is the lifeblood of our economy. You think about that. Virtually every good and service in our economy, a substantial factor in its cost is going to be energy, energy prices. Uh, energy prices work much like taxes do. Uh, when energy prices go up, the price of the good or service that you're purchasing also goes up. When energy prices go down, well then that means that the providers can reduce their cost to you because their costs are less. Now the only difference between changes in energy prices and changes in tax rates is that when government raises your taxes, in theory, at least in theory, you can get something back in return. But when energy prices go up, especially if they're going up for foolish political reasons, you're getting nothing back in return. So give me higher taxes before you give me higher energy prices, because at least for higher taxes, I might, not often, but I still might theoretically get something worthwhile back in return. Now, we can see how this plays out in many ways. We can look at the numbers. Uh, but before we get into the, to the details, and I'll try to keep it brief so we can have more conversation, but there's, there's nothing about uh, the Heartland Institute, there's nothing about me in particular that's anti-solar, anti-wind, or anti-any particular form of energy. What we stand up for, and what I hope you stand up for, is affordable energy. And oftentimes I hear the term, I'm for all of the above energy. I, I'm for an all of the above energy policy. And it's important to understand what an effective all of the above energy policy is. It's not that all of the above, every source of power generation, gets a certain amount of subsidies. It's not that they all get a guaranteed market share, as is the case in over half of the states in our nation. A true all of the above energy policy that makes sense is one where all of the above have an opportunity to compete in a fair and free market, and those two are intertwined. A free market is a fair market and vice versa. And if one particular form of energy is more affordable, it, it, it's a better source, it's gonna win out. If it's not, we shouldn't be subsidizing it and we shouldn't be forcing it upon people. Now, oftentimes I hear, I, I lived the past 15 years in Florida. I just moved to, Wash, or to Chicago in November. And in Florida, I would often hear, but we're the sunshine state. So we should be promoting solar power. I mean, this is where it's gonna make more sense than anywhere in the world. Why aren't we promoting solar power? And you might hear that here out in the West because actually, although Florida deems itself the sunshine state, states like Nevada, uh, states like Utah, states like even Colorado, western Colorado, uh, are better for producing solar power than Florida. So you might hear that about solar power, you might hear that about wind power. But here's, here's an analogy that I like to present. I can tell you that I travel to New York City at least once or twice a year. Uh, I go to Manhattan and I can attest to the fact that what you hear is true. Manhattan, New York City, it is the rat capital of the world. I have seen rats this big that have chased me off city blocks. Well, we have the technology. We can put these big rats, we can put little electrodes on them and we can hook them up on treadmills and put a little generator on there. We have the scientific technology that we can generate electricity from rats running on treadmills. And the fact that New York City is the rat capital of the world doesn't mean that it makes sense to generate electricity from rats running on treadmills because, well, you gotta feed the rats, you have gotta pay for all the equipment, and then each rat's only gonna, you know, the little rat feeder only gonna generate so much electricity. You can do it, but it's prohibitively expensive to get any workable electricity out of it. The rat power is not very concentrated. And the same analogy applies to wind and solar. I would love to see the day where wind and solar power can compete with coal, with oil, with natural gas. Oftentimes we hear the technology's just around the corner. The problem is, the unavoidable fact is that coal, oil, natural gas, conventional energy, the energy is very concentrated. It doesn't take much in terms of resources and effort to turn that into electricity, into workable power. But the energy from the sun, the energy from the wind, it's not very concentrated. Even in Florida, I can crack an egg on my sidewalk and it's never going to fry. So you have to, you have to devote a tremendous amount of resources to harnessing the very diffuse energy and turning it into electricity. Maybe the day will come when they compete, 
I hope it's the case. I don't think it's ever going to happen, but if it does, I'll be the first person to cheer it on. But what we should be realizing is that when energy prices go up, our economy suffers. Our standard of living declines. When energy prices go down, our economy is bolstered in a way that even a tax cut can't provide. And our standard of living, particularly among poor people who have a higher percentage of their income devoted to energy than other people, then those living standards are going to rise. That's what we should be pushing for. Now, looking at the numbers, I don't have to have a Heartland Institute study, although I can certainly write one, to back up what I'm saying. The Brookings Institution, it's a left of center think tank. It pushes renewable power. They published a study last year. They found that to replace our conventional power with wind power would double our electricity costs. For every unit of conventional power that is transferred over to wind power, every unit's gonna double your electricity prices. Solar power, triple. Now, if you say, well, even though they're a left of center think tank, well, they're still a think tank. What about something more objective and official? Well, the Energy Information Administration, the Obama Administration Energy Information Administration, they published data in terms of their projected cost of various energy sources that would be put into effect next year. So with the latest and greatest and best technologies and over the lifespan of those facilities, so for the 30-year lifespan, they assume, for each, uh, for each source, they found that wind power is effectively triple the cost of conventional power and solar power is five times the cost. Now again, it doesn't mean that we should foreclose the, the, poss the possibility that we should rule out the possibility that wind and solar can be a part of the electricity mix. Give them every chance everyone else does. But the most important thing to keep in mind when people want, for example, in 28 states, used to be 30, but now 28 states that have renewable power mandates, when you mandate a particular form of energy to make up a certain percentage of the electricity mix, you are mandating higher prices across the board for your state's electricity prices. States that have imposed renewable power mandates, 28 of them remain, 30 that put them into place. Since 2008, which is the year when almost all the states had implemented their renewable power mandates, those states with renewable power mandates have seen their electricity prices rise twice the pace of the national average. If you want to chase people and businesses and industry out of your state and into your neighboring state, the best way to do it is to impose renewable power mandates. And the best way to bring them back, the best way to raise the living standards of people in your state is to abolish and eliminate your renewable power mandates. So that is an overview of why the Heartland Institute is so involved on energy issues. And there are so many others that we could talk about, and I imagine we will. But that's the one that I think is going to have the most significant impact on people in your state and making the lives better for the people you represent. So thank you so much. I look forward to this conversation. Uh, before we go to open up for questions, since it was in the news this week, I really want the panelists to talk about the Clean Power Plan and how they affect it to how they expect it to affect residents in their state. Or their their issue that they're concerned with too. Go ahead, James. Okay. Well I just talked. You're, but I'm happy to talk again. This. So the Clean Power Plan, of course, that's the polit politically correct name for the carbon dioxide restrictions that are being imposed by the Obama administration. They're requiring a 32% cut uh, by the year 2030, but it is not uniform. Up until now, EPA, the federal government, would say, okay, we have an issue with sulfur dioxide from power plants. So throughout the industry, no matter where you're located, you have to do X or you have to do Y. What's real interesting about the Clean Power Plan is EPA has instead given every state its own required reduction and the amount of the reduction varies by state to state. It's the first time this has ever happened and that's something that is uh, legally susceptible to challenge. And coincidentally enough, who would have thunk it? If you're on the West Coast, if you're in the Northeast, if you're in politically blue states, your cuts aren't nearly what the cuts are for folks in flyover country, uh, for folks in the Intermountain West. And it's really ironic considering that the people who are pushing these carbon dioxide restrictions are the ones who are going to have to cut the lease and they're forcing it upon everyone else. Where have we seen that before, Ken? So, uh, so essentially, the, the, the point is this. Uh, the scientific evidence is that humans are contributing some to global warming, but in proper context, temperatures are below the average that they've been over the past six, seven, eight thousand years, the time period during which human civilization developed and flourished. They only seem warm compared to temperatures of the past few hundred years, which is when the Little Ice Age ended. The rate of increase has been modest, 
and warmer temperatures have always benefited human health and welfare, and they continue to do so. If we do believe that we must do something about uh, global warming, uh, then we also have to make sure that what we're going to do is cost effective, that it makes sense. Uh, right now, China emits more carbon dioxide than every nation in the Western Hemisphere combined. Combined. And their emissions are growing by 10% per year. So if not only the United States, but every other nation, Canada, Mexico, Venezuela, Brazil, et cetera, implemented this clean power plan, and in fact did more than that, completely eliminated our emissions today, in less than a year it wouldn't matter because new emissions in China would totally negate that. So what we're doing right now is we're imposing tremendous economic hardship on the American people, on the people in your state. It's being done unfairly. It's being implemented politically to single out people who have not voted for Obama in states that are not blue states. And it's going to have absolutely no real world impact on temperatures. Let me just add two things real quickly. One is, is that in, in many cases, the, the regulations are simply unattainable. Um, Washington State, we, our governor, Jay Inslee, um, likes to call himself the greenest governor in the country. Uh, but when they sent in their comments for the 111D rule, they actually complained that the, that, that the rules may be unattainable because we have a lot of hydro, we have nuclear, and we have some wind. But in order to increase the amount of energy that, and to deal with all of those intermittent sources, we're gonna have to build natural gas. And they actually even wrote, because renewable energy is dependent on some load following fossil resources, Washington needs natural gas. This is a point that we've been making, right? That you can only go so far with wind and solar and intermittents and you need natural gas. And they always say, that's nonsense. You're bought off by the fossil fuel industry. And yet in their own comments to the federal government, they sort of say, by the way, we need some natural gas. The second thing though is, is that this is, if you truly care about reducing carbon emissions, this approach is the least effective and most expensive way to do it. In terms of actual carbon emissions for the, for the dollar, you get much less with this than uh, all sorts of other alternatives. This regulatory approach um, causes uh, rates to go up, but the actual amount of benefit you get is very low. Caring about the environment means that you demand the most bang for your buck. And if you believe that climate change is a crisis and we must act now, you cannot then turn around and say, oh, but it's okay if we waste a lot of money on small uh, benefits because we need to do something. You should demand that you get the most benefits for every dollar that you spend, and this plan simply doesn't do that. Again. What they have done is they have fixated on a few sort of boogeymen, fixated on that, rather than the goal that they claim they care about, which is cutting carbon emissions. Can, can I add one? They covered it very well. I'll just, okay. uh, can I add one point here? They, they give it the name, the Clean Power Plan. And I want you to remember the quotation marks around the word clean. Because <clears throat> what the global warming activists want you to think is that the only environmental issue that is in play is emissions. According to the US EPA, federal government official stats, emissions of the six principal pollutants that they track, the six ones that they're most concerned about, have declined by more than 70% since 1980. That battle has already been fought and won. When they talk about clean power, I want to ask them this, and I hope you do too. What is so quote unquote clean about wind turbines slicing to death in mid-flight 1.5 million birds and bats every year? when you splatter the blood of these creatures all over the landscape, that's not very clean to me. And that's while providing only 3% of our electricity from wind power. If you ramp it up to 20, 30%, now you're talking 15 million birds and bats sliced to death in mid-flight, many of which are, are endangered species. What is so clean about developing so much undeveloped land and littering them with these steel behemoths that are standing up in the, in the middle of the Great Plains or on mountaintop ridges, et cetera? According to the American Wind Energy Association's own numbers, it requires 600 square miles of wind turbines to replace the power of a single conventional power plant. There's nothing clean about littering the landscape with industrial development and slicing to death birds, bats, and other creatures for this carbon-free, carbon reduction source of power. It's more than just carbon dioxide, and it's more than just emissions. And if we want to talk about clean energy, we should really be talking about the total environmental impacts. If I could on there, just take off on that a little bit. That, that begs the question of reliability as well. And, and to, to build a solar panel or a wind turbine, you have to have an abundance of rare earth elements. 
Um, right now, our supply of rare earth elements comes 90% from China. And so the more we shift, the more any of our electronics technology is dependent on rare earth elements. 60 Minutes did a piece about two months ago that said our national security, our electronics technology is in the grips of China. They've cornered something like 90% of the market share on rare earth elements, and yet from New Mexico to Alaska, rare earth elements are locked up in abundance in federally controlled lands. Cool. Thank you guys, so interesting. Um, I would like to open the floor for questions now. We've stunned you. <laughs> Thank you. Fred Burma, Mito Freedom Foundation. <clears throat> so as I listen to you uh, describe some of the issues, whether it's Western lands or environmental policy, I mean, a thought that comes to mind, if you look at many issues um, that we face, whether it's education policy or even uh, fiscal policy, it, at least there's a sense among the general public, there's some understanding that with education we're not getting uh, our bang for our buck, or at least on the fiscal side, people have heard a lot about the debt. I don't think, and I can't think of another issue where there's a greater disconnect between the reality of environmentalism and people's perceptions of it. And why is that so, and how can we change that? The reason it's so, from my opinion, is, is that we allowed it to be so. That we didn't express clearly our concern for environmental stewardship. Um, when I worked at the Department of Natural Resources, we would do polls um, on forestry issues to try to see where the public was. And one of the questions we asked is, who do you trust on forestry issues? Do you trust the environmental community or the timber industry? This is Washington State. The environmental community got in the high 30s, the timber industry got in the low 40s. In Washington State, more people trusted the timber industry with regard to the environment than environmental community. But if you care about the environment and you're looking for somebody to say, okay, I care about the environment, who's proposing the policies, the f we've basically abandoned the field in many ways. Right? The environmental community is constantly throwing things out there. And so for folks who care about the environment, which is, frankly, everybody, and you're looking for solutions, and one side is not offering them, people who don't do the research and who simply feel like, I want to help the environment, feel like they only have one place to go. But if you give them an alternative, and that's what we've seen in Washington State and people, the Washington legislators who are familiar with forestry is the timber community, and the unions and other folks said, look, here's how we can do good forestry in Washington State that involves harvesting, that involves making healthy forests. People chose that. Um, we don't do that on every case. And I think that one thing, a trap that we fall into is, is that when the environmental community trumps up a, a, a claim about clean air, clean water, carbon, and things like that, and they, and they scream, we're all going to die, too often our reaction is, that's bogus, that's phony. And what it sounds like is, is that we don't care. And I, and I think that we need to be careful about that. That doesn't mean that we need to just sort of go along and try to do you know, their crazy thing better. I'm not advocating that at all. But I do think that we need to be clearer about the fact that we care about the environment. We're the ones who live near it, right? We don't live in downtown Seattle. We live out near the forests, and we work the land. So that's, that's why I think that's happened. There's a real opportunity there, and when you engage, the environmentalist lose. Yeah, I mean, Fred, you know this very well, but um, I, I think there is a tremendous opportunity. Failed policies fail. That's what they do. And, and these policies now, given two, three decades, are failing demonstrably. You know, you had uh, University of California Merced scientists about a month ago said that if they just harvested the Sierra Nevadas to the sustainable tree density, 50, 60 trees per acre, they would preserve in drought-stricken California significantly more than a quarter trillion gallons of water a year. At the same time, they would have vibrant communities, fund education, fund public safety. You've got in uh, Oregon, just down the road, Josephine County, Oregon, I mean, this was an NPR story. NPR did a story about a woman that calls 911. I mean, Josephine County, their main industry is forestry, right? Shut down because of the spotted owl, 
25th anniversary of the spotted owl a month and a half ago. Species is still declining faster than ever. Forest health declining, communities are dying. That's the 25 year record of the spotted owl. And now they're going out and taking shotguns and shooting the barred owl because that's the bigger, faster cousin that gets to the food source. But that information isn't out there. And, and um, we've got, there are literally body counts. I mean, Oregon, this woman calls 911 because they, their harvest, their resource has been taken away. She says, somebody's beating my door down. Can you send the sheriff out? She says, no, I'm sorry. The sheriff only operates from 9 to 5 because they've gone from 30 sheriff's deputies down to 2 because their resource has been locked up. She says, no, the sheriff only operates from 9 to 5. The 911 operator says, can you ask him to go away? Did it work? She says, I already tried that. <laughs> then, then the response was, well, can you go around him? No, he's blocking my only way out. She says, well, all I can tell you is to call back tomorrow. I mean, the woman was, was raped and brutalized, and Sheriff Gilbertson put out a press release to say, if you know you have domestic relations issues, you should move somewhere else. I, I can't protect you in this county. When their resource is so vibrant, they used to have some of the best funded school districts in the nation. But we've, we've got to tell these stories. In Alaska, King Cove, Alaska, they have a body count now going because it, it's socked in. It's only accessible by air. They can't get out in the winter. There are times they can't get out by air. They want a 10-mile, one-lane road to a town that has a year-round airport. 10-mile, one-lane road in the 400 million acres that is Alaska, but it would cut through the corner of a wilderness area. 10-mile, one-lane Jeep trail is all they want to be able to evacuate people. People are literally dying. And, and the Secretary of the Interior says, well, no, I'm sorry, it, it's, you don't really need that road. These are things that we really have, stories we have to get out. We, we've got to get more effective at doing that. Failed policies fail. We have to show that and maybe get beyond the white papers and start telling the stories. If I can add, I, I really appreciate and understand the, the concerns uh, expressed in the question. We are fighting an uphill battle. The mainstream media is, uh, I mean, they're, they're leaning left across the board and especially on environmental issues. But, don't get discouraged and don't feel that just because we can't win the battle with the media that we can't win uh, in the court of public opinion. Uh, if you look at, for example, global warming, if you look at the public opinion polls, it drives the alarmists crazy that when they ask about how many people are very concerned about global warming, the number is very low. When they ask people how many believe global warming is human caused versus natural caused, and, and it's hard to say precisely probably about half of each over the past few decades, but it's hard to tell for sure. But the American public generally are split down the middle. And that's not the message that the media is trying to sell. It's not the message the environmental activist groups are trying to sell. And I think a big part of that is that if this were 30 years ago, all we'd have for our information would be the three major networks and then maybe a couple newspapers, all which lean left, and people would not have access to the truth. But now we have the internet. People can go to the Heartland Institute website, the Washington Policy Center website, wherever it may be, scientists who are reporting the truth. We have talk radio, we have cable television, we have all sorts of ways to get the word out beyond read, the Read media. good books. Reading good books by Todd Myers. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, when we try to get the information out, we may have an uphill fight because the mainstream media is against us, but we get the information out. Oftentimes, I'll give a global warming talk. If I have 20 or 30 minutes, I have to choose what I want to put in that 20 or 30 minutes. And I'll have someone from the audience say, well, Mr. Taylor, why didn't you mention this and this? And it blows me away, and it makes me so happy that people understand that. So when I mention the facts about wind turbines killing 1.5 million birds and bats every year, not only are people generally aware of the devastation caused by these so-called clean energy sources, sometimes people will quote those exact, exact numbers back to me. And I'll give you another example. And when we're going to spread the word, the truth is going to get out, and people will listen, and policymakers will listen. After the BP Gulf oil spill, we were told what a horrible environmental holocaust it was. And it was truly tragic that we had this happen. President Obama, before the week was out, when the wellhead blew out, said, this is a reason why we need more wind power. We need more clean energy. We, we need more wind power. And he specifically said wind power. Well, after the wellhead was capped and the environmental cleanup was completed, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, official federal government agency, they did an environmental body count on the marine birds, the marine reptiles, the marine mammals that were killed in that oil spill. Their final tally, give or take a few dozen, was 6,500. The proposed solution to avoid a once-in-a-generation oil spill that killed 6,500 
was to have more wind turbines that kill 1.5 million each and every year. Now, most people don't know that, but when we spread the word, and we have to go around the mainstream media often to do it, people will get on board like they have regarding global warming. So yes, we do face an uphill battle, but don't give up hope. Don't think that we need to concede the issue or we need to just put our tail between our legs and say we've lost, because we're winning on a lot of fronts and we can win on all fronts, because I think the truth will ultimately prevail. Senator Jan Angel here in Washington State, and boy, the stuff you've hit today is really timely for me. I've gotten hit, and I don't know if the other legislators have, but I'm being hit right now really hard on the Clean Power Plan. And their form letters, I don't know for sure where they're coming because they are all constituents of my district. So is there a place uh, that I can go? Uh, you, you may already have the talking points for this on websites, but if you could S help us. Send one to me, I, I'd be interested because. Yeah, they're coming hard and heavy. The first thing I did yesterday is send back a response to every one of them saying, have you read the plan? And I'm getting some yeses with a lot of details, so now I need more detail to educate and fight back, so I'd appreciate that. And also, public lands. I was getting hit really hard with this a couple weeks ago, and while we're here, I had my LA send me one of those emails so I could see what was their beef on that, and it was from hunting and fishing groups afraid they were not gonna have public access to those lands if it comes to the states. So. FYI. <laughs> yeah, on, on that second point, Senator Fielder from Montana's back here. She actually ran a bill in their legislature that said if and when the lands come to the states, we won't sell the lands. We'll keep them open, keep them accessible, which goes along with the same policy all the western states are pursuing. She runs the bill and in committee, guess who opposes the bill? All the same environmental groups that have been harping about we don't want you to lock up access, you're gonna ruin and lock up access to the lands. So uh, where a lot of that comes from, there was a, a Swiss billionaire uh, put up about $20 million to try to take so-called hunting and fishing groups, the kind of the green decoy groups, and, and come out as if, as if the land would be locked up. I'd invite you to go to the American Lands Council website, and in the About section, there's a policy statement. The policy statement was passed unanimously by leaders throughout the nation on this, and, Critically, federal public lands become state public lands for multiple use, sustained yield with local planning, preserving all valid existing rights. We have to do that. We didn't invite this accident of history. We didn't invite the federal government to control our land for 100 years or, plus or more, but that's where we are. And so there are legal rights and other rights that have accrued over that time, and so we have to, to recognize and respect those that's why federal public lands become state public lands. State and local governments deal with that transition to preserve valid existing rights in the transition for how we deal with those issues. Um, and it's critical, but that's the fact that, the fact that they're attacking and engaging and mischaracterizing shows us where we are on that Gandhi scale, right? The Gandhi scale, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Regarding your first point, um, sitting right behind you is John Noter, who is the head of our government relations department. And you may have seen and received in the past, we put out research and commentaries uh, that we send to legislators. And I don't know if we've done one on the clean power plan yet. If we haven't, I suspect we would. But uh, you can expect to hear from John and his staff on that topic. And if you don't, or if you have a hard time finding it, you can email me, jtaylor at heartland.org. You can email John and we'll get you that information. One other thing, just uh, anecdotally, uh, President Obama on August 24th is going to be the keynote speaker at Harry Reid's Clean Energy Summit in Las Vegas. They just announced that, the White House did this past week, and we're putting out a rapid response team. We're going to hold a press conference uh, at the same time, uh, the same place if we can, and we're going to put out the, the truth about affordable energy versus so-called clean energy that is neither clean nor affordable. So expect to hear a little bit more about that as well. I think we've got time for uh, one more question. Yeah, Art Wittick, Montana House. Um, it's my understanding that under 111, the Clean Power Plan, it's a recent administrative decision that CO2 is a pollutant. And they have then set forth these standards. And the feds are very good at setting standards, not very good at implementing. So my question is, uh, and, and knowing that there's, you know, it, there will be a change in administration, 
Um, why don't the states just not participate? Why don't the states um, let the feds try to figure out how to implement a 30% reduction in CO2? I'm happy to take that, but I'll let you guys go first if you like. Uh, no, I just think the, the, the risk that you take, of course, is, is that the, the feds can impose their own plan. And so it is, it's simply a, a sort of a risk management question. I don't think it's a, a science or governmental question, it's just a risk management. You want the devil you know or the devil you don't. Um, I know that there are plenty of states that are probably going to go that route and give that a shot. Um, I don't know what the result will be. Obviously, if there's a different, if there's a more conservative administration, that may pay off. But that's, I think it comes down to just a risk management question. And, and I would point out there, there really are two schools of thought, and, and Todd touched on that, as to whether the state should go along and say, we're at the state level with our environmental officials, and we can craft this to do the least amount of harm possible under such an onerous requirement. And I can see that. And there are those who say, you know what, let the feds own it and let's challenge this in court. And we, we, we may have a, a sound ground. I'm, it's very difficult to overturn federal regulations, federal rules, uh, federal mandates in court, but this is one we have a, where you have a better chance than most. And also politically, once you say, well, we'll craft the best option for our state, whoever does so, now you own that. Um, I see a lot, this really isn't my topic area, but nevertheless, for states that uh, took the federal the gilded cage for Medicare expansion, or Medicaid expansion. And now they say, well, you know, we'll take the money and we'll craft it this way or that way. And then now all of a sudden, they own it. They're defending, John Kasich did it last night, the Medicaid expansion in the first place, not just the fact that the, the dollars made it possible. I think that when you have an argument against the existence of the carbon dioxide restrictions in the first place, my personal thought is, you don't give that up and just try to say, we're going to have maybe 10% less cost than the government might impose, or 20% less costly means the government might, might uh, impose. I think you battle that. I think you stand on principle. I think you make them own it. I think you remind them of it every day, and you make them pay a political price for it. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, I think if I could, this is a, this is a critical watershed moment, I think, Art. Um, the Supreme Court three years ago said that the jurisdiction over health, safety, welfare, the police power, is possessed by the states, but not the federal government. They said that the independent power of the states <coughs> serves as a check on the arbitrary power of the federal government, and that states are separate and independent sovereigns. Sometimes they have to act like it, not ask like it, not litigate like it. And that was the US Supreme, I mean, it wasn't Madison, it wasn't Jefferson, it wasn't you know, any of the others, that was the Supreme Court Three years ago, Justice Roberts, writing for the court, said these are the basic principles of our government. Um, Justice Kennedy said this system where that power is divided was our unique contribution to political theory and political thought in the world, was dividing that power. I think that's why we're hearing now CSG, NCSL, ALEC, all of them, beginning to talk about federalism, uh, not really understanding necessarily where to go. I was. Uh, Smoking a brisket for Fourth of July it was fabulous. If you come to Utah, let me know. We'll fire it up and, and get you going. But it takes a day and a half. And so over the day and a half and smoking the brisket and firing the coals, I was rereading the Declaration of Independence. Of course, the first two paragraphs talk about the principles of good government. This is what good government looks like. And then, then they lay out 27 complaints as to how the king is violating the principles of good government. The one that really stood out to me, it just fascinated me, it never really caught me like that before, but it says, he has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. Think about that. I mean, they knew so clearly what jurisdiction was that was foreign to their constitution, which was the British Constitution at the time, but still upheld the principles of consent of the governed, and acts of pretended legislation. Could we, our colleagues, our legislative council, our governors, our attorneys general, designate something, whether it was an act of pretended legislation or actually within the very limited jurisdiction of the federal government? I would submit that until we get together as states acting as a team, which is how federalism is played, it's a team sport, 
acting as a union of states until we come to a good understanding where we, as an independent power, check to the federal government, can tell and stand with the same moral certainty that they were able to on what is pretended legislation and what is not, I'm afraid we'll keep getting more of the same. That really is a critical, fundamental, systemic issue. And from my part, going back to police power, health, safety, welfare, this is clearly, in my view, an act of pretended legislation, but it takes a team of states with enough moral certainty to act upon that. Let me just say that in Washington State, since we legalized marijuana, smoking a brisket means something different to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, one more thought, if I may. I love that. The Clean Power Plan, it's an executive administrative act. A future administration can pull that back. Now, I understand that it's, it, it, we don't have a very strong track record of even when we have people professing to be limited government, conservative, whatever else, of rolling back regulations. But it's possible. It can be done. And I can tell you that more than one, the staffs of more than one of the presidential candidates that you saw yesterday have been in contact with me personally. Hey, James, what can we do? If, if we're elected, what are the things that we can do right off the bat to have a more common sense energy and environment policy? So they're at least listening. They're paying attention, and there's at least a chance they can roll that back. Once a state submits their own implementation plan, once they commit to doing all these things to restrict carbon dioxide emissions, which really means restricting affordable energy and pushing very expensive energy upon their, their constituents, it's going to be much more difficult for the people who take the route of championing that to also pull back if it's no longer federally required. And that's something that I think is very important. Well, thank you all for your time, and thank you so much to the panelists. Please give them a round of applause.